wholeheartedness is about maturity. It's about actually accessing everything that Jesus did for us on the cross. The forgiveness of sins, huge deal, but that's just the doorway we walk through in order to enter into unbroken relationship with God through which everything else flows. And too many Christians walk through that doorway and they stay there for the rest of their earthly lives. And they miss out on the full abundant life that Jesus came to offer them. But I believe God says for the wholehearted, you can have it all. That's what it means to be wholehearted is to thirst first for God. So this idea of wholehearted, we really find it in the life of David. David was described as a man after God's own heart. Now we know by looking at David, he was not perfect. He didn't always get it right. And yet he was defined as a man after God's own heart. And then when he commissions his son Solomon to take the throne and take leadership of Israel, as I mentioned earlier, he addresses the motives in the matters of the heart. We know that Solomon got this at first. In fact, after he built the temple and then he was dedicating the temple to God and he was then encouraging the people to worship and to seek God first and foremost, he actually echoes the heart of his father, David. And yet as we follow the life of Solomon, what we discover, he gave his heart to other loves. He gave his worship to other gods. And at the end of his time as the king, it says in 1 Kings 11, he was not wholeheartedly devoted to the Lord. So even right off the get-go, like this whole idea of wholeheartedness, it's like, okay, is it always or is it sometimes? Is it behavior or is it motive? It's a little difficult to determine if we're wholehearted or not. We're not good at this. We don't know how to assess the motives of our spouse and, and, and our family members. How much less do we know how to address the motives and assess the motives of our neighbors and our coworkers and our politicians? And so in a year where God's saying, I want you to be more wholeheartedly devoted to me, if you think about this with some real thought, you might come to a conclusion, I don't know if I am. Is it behavior? Is it intention? Jesus, what are you going for? How can we move towards a wholehearted life and a wholehearted devotion to you? So if you look at the life of Jesus, what you'll discover, he doesn't use the word wholehearted specifically at all. Here's one of the ways he addresses it. Matthew 22, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. These weren't original words to Jesus. These are found in Deuteronomy chapter six, verse five, and they are a summary of all God said to the people of Israel when the, he was inviting them into relationship with him, that everything between me and you, between us has to be rooted in love. If we love God, we will eventually obey him. It might not happen overnight. Your life might not change in a moment, but if you love God, you will eventually find yourself more and more obedient to the teaching, the words and the ways of Jesus. So Jesus addressed wholehearted devotion in his teaching, what he invited us into, just he didn't use the word wholehearted in the way that it was used in the Old Testament. And here's how I think we could sum up everything Jesus had to say about wholeheartedness. I think we can sum it up in this one simple word, surrender. That's ultimately what Jesus was getting at. Life in Jesus is not about agreement. It's not about saying, yeah, I, I just agree that you were the son of God and you died and rose again. It's about surrender. It's about actually believing that because Jesus died and rose again, he's God, I'm not and his way is better than my way. And when we can surrender, we can enter into everything that God has for us to be a people who thirst first for God. And really what that means is it's a matter of the will. We actually have a level of determination in our lives that God has given us. The will is the power to shift our entire destiny and we are not victims and we are not powerless and we are not helpless in every way. We have a will. Now, what we don't have always is the ability to stop doing a habitual sin that we've tried to stop doing forever. 
What we sometimes don't have is the ability to believe God for miracles when we've seen so much disappointment in our lives. What we sometimes don't have is the ability to just be joyful when life feels hard. But what we do have in every one of those situations is this tiny thing deep inside called the will where we can offer this yes to God. And all he's asking for is that little yes in order to grab a hold of our hearts and move us in his direction, to free us from the sin in our lives, to give us joy when we're in the midst of difficulty, or even to give us belief and faith and hope when we have experienced disappointment. We can't muster all that stuff up, but God can release it in us through an act of our will. And what every one of us can do when it comes to relationship with Jesus is we can make little decisions of our will that allow us to surrender and to submit what he has for us. Jesus's greatest temptation in life was not the lies of the enemy in the desert. It was submitting to the will of the Father in the garden. 